I want to talk to you about David's new card. Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. His motive was good, but his method was wrong. His intentions were good, but his implementation was wrong. God had ordered that the ark was to be carried only on the shoulders of the Levites. David loaded it on a new cart, drawn by oxen. Now he got his idea, no doubt, from the Philistines. And the new cart was an expedient borrowed from the enemies of Israel. And on the way, you know this simple story. The oxen stumbled, and those uh, tried to steady it and died. Some people don't think the punishment fits the crime here, and they worry about us and why. This strange tragedy has some serious lessons for us today. The church is carrying the ark on a new cart these times. Just as David borrowed the idea from the Philistines, the church today has borrowed from the world many of the vehicles of her ministry. We study the techniques of this age, the gadgetry of the business world, the social world, and the entertainment world, looking for new carts on which to carry the ark of our testimony. We hold a wet finger up to the air to ascertain which way the popular wind is blowing and set the sails to catch the breeze. And instead of asking how does God do it, we're trying to get ideas from how does the world do it. And we have become religious copycats, mimicking the mannequins of this Punch and Judy show that somebody misnamed Progress. But worship is, our worship is streamlined, our preaching slanted to tickle the ears of a generation that cannot endure sound doctrine. Today the ark is rocking and Uzzah is worried and the brethren are bothered about the unsteadiness of our doctrine and our wavering churches and the unstable swaying of modern Christianity and sincere efforts are being made to stabilize the situation. But it'll end only as Uzzah did in tragedy, for we've started out wrong. And we must give up our new carts and get God's work on the shoulders of separated and dedicated people. Now, what was the sin of Uzzah? Well, don't forget that he was the son of Abinadab. And all his life he had seen the ark in his home. It had become a familiar piece of furniture. The ark had become just a box. He had lost regard for the sacredness of it as a symbol of God's presence among his people. Oh, Matthew Henry said perhaps he affected to show before this great assembly how bold he could make with the ark, having been so long acquainted with it. Familiarity, even with that which is most awful, is apt to breed contempt. Uzzah was a Levite, but he wasn't a priest, and only priests could touch the ark, Numbers 415, and then only under certain circumstances. Now, we today are, in a very real sense, uh, Levites, but not priests, and it's a sad day when the ark becomes a box, when we become so familiar with Scripture and worship and the ordinances that we lose our reverence. Alexander McLaren said, we have a lost sense of all. Nothing is more delicate than a sense of all. Trifle with it ever so little, and it speedily disappears. There's far too little of it in our modern religion. Watch the Sunday morning congregation, the average church congregation. You don't see much all out there. And you hear a lot about relevance, but not much about reverence. You can take God's name in vain in church on Sunday morning. That's a common thing, though we might be startled to think about it. A coarse and casual familiarity with the things of God. I heard of some travelers in Africa, back down in South Africa, back when diamonds were plentiful, chanced upon some uh, young fellows who seemed to be playing marbles. 
And they drew near and they were playing marbles with diamonds. Today we're doing something like that, handling carelessly the coinage of the Word of God without stopping to examine to see whose image and superscription may be thereupon. In Vienna they have Beethoven's piano, and some tourists were going through one time, and one uh, young girl, a teenager in the crowd, sat down and played some rock and roll on it. And the caretaker was visibly bothered, and uh, after he was through, he said that Paderewski came through here some years ago. And she said, what did he play? He said, nothing. He had too much respect for Beethoven's piano. A cheap familiarity with the things of God. It's only by the long suffering of God that more corpses don't lie around today, like others before the ark. Beware of the ark becoming a box. We can become so accustomed to being Christians and to being preachers even that we place unholy hands on sacred things. Now, our intentions may be good, so are others. But Matthew Henry says again, it will not suffice to say of that which is ill done that it was well meant. That won't excuse it. The problem was that the, not that the oxen stumbled and the cart shook and the ark lurched, there shouldn't have been any oxen, there shouldn't have been any cart to begin with. And no matter how many others try to steady the ark, we're working on the wrong problem, not going to help matters and speed things along by making better carts and hiring more trained others. There are new ways of raising church money, new ways to interest the young people, new ways to increase church attendance. And new styles in church music, and never have there been so many new carts running all over the place, but never has the ark wobbled like it's wobbling now. There's plenty of fanfare in music, and some of it's lamentable, uh, and some of it's certainly not God's idea. I read here in First Chronicles 13, 4, that this idea was right in the eyes of all the people. David had the crowd with him, but he didn't have God with him on this. It's possible to put on quite a religious parade and put on a performance instead of having an experience, a form of godliness without the power thereof. A.W. Tozer, who was a prophet, undeniably, said, Evangelical Christianity is now tragically below the New Testament standard. Worldliness is accepted as part of our way of life. Our religious mood is social instead of spiritual. We've lost the art of worship. We're not producing saints. Our models are successful businessmen, celebrated athletes, and theatrical personalities. We carry on our religious activities after the methods of the modern advertiser. Our homes are turned into theaters. Our literature is shallow. Our hymnody borders on sacrilege, and scarcely anyone appears to care. There's no mistaking what he was driving at with language like that. It's David's card all over again. And then there's another angle to this episode. There was something personal about carrying the ark on the shoulders of the Levites, but shifting it to a cart lessened the sense of personal responsibility. Today the Lord's work has become impersonal. We let a machine do a lot of it. Uh, putting our shoulders to the wheel is not the same thing as putting our shoulders under the ark. A lot of fancy carts, and they may take a load off of some shoulders, but you cannot transfer personal responsibility. It may seem more sophisticated to have a new cart. Maybe you can travel quicker, but it actually took them longer to get where they were going this way than if they carried it right from the beginning. God's Word must be done by God's people, God's way. God will accept nothing else, whatever. Now, sanctify yourselves that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord. The church of Jesus Christ is not an old Adam improvement society. 
And people who have never died to sin and risen to walk in newness of life are walking down church aisles, rededicating themselves, and they could do it a thousand times. God cannot use the old Adam no matter how many times he rededicates himself. There are some verses ought to be hung up in every Sunday school room of every church. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. No flesh can glory in his presence. They that are born in the Spirit cannot perfect themselves in the flesh. In Exodus 30, the anointing oil for the priests had three restrictions. Upon man's flesh it should not be poured. You're not to compound anything like it, no imitations, no substitutes, and don't put any of it on a stranger. The holy unction from above is not produced in any of the apothecaries of this world trying to make old Adam into a deacon or a Sunday school teacher or a preacher is an abomination unto the Lord. You can't do it, just can't be done. It would be comical if it weren't so tragic the way we plunge in all directions today trying to popularize the gospel. The Ichabod Memorial Church calls in a folk musical, and the church at Ephesus has a TV celebrity, and Pergamos has somebody who can play a fiddle and beat drums and uh, play a harmonica all at the same time. Every time the world comes along with something new, here comes the church trotting along after trying to get some ideas. Uh, we need, we, we think we have to have something new all the time. We need something so old that it'd be new if anybody tried it. But unless the breath of God blows across it, you don't have anything after all. Sardis had a name to be alive. Don't ever get that church wrong. They had a name to be a live wire church. And Jesus said, I've got another name for you. Now morticians can dress up a corpse till it looks better than it ever looked while they were living. And you can do that sometimes with the church, but you can't fool God. Daniel Webster said, You may look on the church and see all the external appearance of Christianity and yet find nothing of its essence, just as you may contemplate an embalmed body where art has preserved proportion and form amid nerves without action and veins without blood. God does not anoint corpses, no matter how well some theological mortician may have embalmed them. We are ministers, we're not mummies, and the pulpit's no place for a king to it. So musicians were added here. David added some uh, new music, and the church has fallen into something of the same trap. Uh, let the world sing its own songs. We have a better song to sing. The gospel singing ought to start from the heart. There's a place for art indeed, but making melody in your hearts unto the Lord. Finally, everything was in order, and David started again. It was a time of great rejoicing. It always is when God's people get right. But there was one person who didn't enjoy this event, and it was David's wife, Michael. She had bad blood in her veins. She despised him, and met him with satire and scorn, and suffered the shame of barrenness for the rest of her life. 